one of TNC Louisiana's um, uh, best restoration ecologists and botanists is, is Lattimore Smith, and this is this is inherently his talk, which I've kind of adapted a little bit. Uh, he couldn't be here today, and so I'm kind of pinch hitting for him. Um, and as you heard, I'm kind of from a forestry background, but I'm, and so I'm getting into this from that direction. Uh, but I have, you know, some experience with prescribed fire and, and uh, a newfound love for coastal prairie. So um, that's that's kind of where I'm coming from. This is just a little bit of a background, especially for those of you from Texas. Um, this is a geologic map of Louisiana. This is actually kind of simplified a simplified version of that map. Um, but the most of Louisiana, much of Louisiana, relative to other southeastern states, is of relatively young origin. Holocene, 5,000 to 10,000 years ago, in geologic terms, very young. And that's the alluvial. Uh, floodplains and the coast. But the area that we're interested in is um, kind of in here. That's a Pleistocene origin, the, the interglacial periods that when the sea uh, was rising and falling, and that got built in that time period. And the only reason I, I show this is just kind of the background because you know the geology is the foundation of the soils, and the soils are the foundation of our ecosystem here. And if you haven't seen this yet, you're not aware of it, here it is. You'll see it again, I'm sure. Uh, this was the historic range of coastal prairie. In Louisiana, two to three million acres. In Texas, um, upwards of six million acres. So by no means a petty ecosystem. But to a lot of Louisianians, any, almost anyone you talk to in Louisiana has no idea that we have prairie in this state. Just a, just a foreign concept to most people. Um, and one of the questions that I enter into this with, especially coming from a forestry background, is why the hell didn't we even have prairie here uh, in a state, in an area, especially on the eastern side of the range that gets 50 to 65 inches of rainfall a year? Why is there prairie here? And getting at that question is kind of what I'm here to talk about. And this provides a little bit of background on Louisiana's fire-maintained ecosystems. So if you take both of the longleaf pine kind of broad subtypes, the flatwoods and the hilly longleaf pine, five to seven million acres in Louisiana historically, another five to seven million in, in shortleaf pine, which burned on occasion, coastal marshes, two to five million acres, and then coastal prairie, close to three million acres. So all total, that's well over half of Louisiana's entire land base was fire adapted ecosystems. And I think even for a lot of us who, who deal with fire and think about fire, I didn't think about this until relatively recently. If you would have taken like, the amount of fire that was happening on a, in a given year in Louisiana, let's just disregard <coughs> Texas for a second, was amazing. Uh, well over half the state was burning in a given year. And if we take that and we step back and we think about the coastal prairies of Texas, we step back and we think about the coastal plain and the rest of the southeast, and we think about the rest of Texas and the Midwestern prairies in the western United States, that is just a kind of mind-blowing amount of fire. If you could have taken a plane in 1430 and flown it over to the United States just on a random Tuesday, the amount of fire that you would have seen over this continent would have really been amazing. And that's an important point to think about in terms of um, fire as a, as a tool and as something that was a natural part of our ecosystem. So that's just kind of the headset that I've gotten into. Where was all this fire coming from? It, and that, that is a fundamental and key question. And there remains a lot of debate about this. Um, there certainly were uh, lightning started fires. There certainly were fires that were started by Native Americans. A lot of, not just ecologists, but anthropologists, historians, uh, paleontologists, a lot of people across the field have debated about this topic. And people come down sort of one side or the other. And 
the answer to me is a little bit of both, but I'm going to read you a little bit of um, both sides of the debate. The first thing I'm going to read is from a paper uh, by Dr. Jim Gracie and, and others. Larry Allen, I think, was part of this. Um, they looked at the effects of, of coastal prairie in Texas, and this is what they had to say. Based on the, on the historical literature, lightning was not a major ignition source on the coastal prairie, with the exception, perhaps, of drought years. So we know from the settlers and from uh, early ex explorers that Indians were lighting up the prairie all over the place. They were lighting up fires all over the place. And one wing of the, of the argument says that lightning was only able to do so much because it was in concert with a lot of wet periods. And a lot of the historical evidence we have shows that Native Americans were lighting fires left and right. So there's that side of it. This quote is from uh, a paper by Reed Noss, who's a, a fire ecologist, grasslands ecologist out of Central Florida. And he says, uh, those who have convinced themselves that humans created virtually all grasslands would do well to reconsider their position in light of climato climatological and paleological evidence. Paleological research shows that grasslands in North America, including the South, have been present for millions of years, and grassland taxa have evolved adaptations to tolerate or exploit fire. And so, Noss is sort of saying that Native Americans were clearly lighting fire, but grasslands preceded humans. You know, Native Americans are known from at least 10,000, probably close to 20,000 years in North America. And uh, the taxa which we, we see in grasslands that are well adapted to fire go well back farther than that. Uh, red cockaded woodpeckers have been found in, this, in the fossil record from 180,000 to 200,000 years ago. That's a, that's a grassland fire adapted woodpecker species. So there's arguments to both sides of this question. Lattimore put in, does it matter here? And I think what he's trying to get at is Science has, has told us how often these systems burn. We know how often Longley Pine burn. We know more or less how often coastal prairie burn. And because of that, it doesn't, doesn't maybe matter whether it came from Native Americans or lightning. I would actually argue that that's true, but it also does matter because the season that burns happened is important. And Lightning was going to set fires necessarily in a given time of year. Native Americans would have done so too. They would have been much more variable, especially considering disease, population dynamics, all the things historians tell us about. So I think it does and it doesn't matter. <laughs> that clears it up. <laughs> uh, William Bartram, you know, a lot of explorers talked about fire, seeing fire all over the place. Bartram was actually relatively late in the game compared to some of the others. And he actually never got down to the coastal prairie. He stopped in Baton Rouge and turned around. But um, he talks about here about seeing fire all over the place almost every day of the year. And he's talking about Indians lighting them, but also about lightning. So Bartram doesn't necessarily clear the muddy water for us. Uh, but he's just an example of, of the, the historical record. We do know that lightning played a significant role possibly a, a primary role in starting fires across the southeast, including the coastal prairie. In long pine systems, lightning would strike trees, both snags and living trees, and would start fires that way. But it would also occasionally strike the ground. And in coastal prairie, of course, there's not many trees. But historically, there were what we call these gallery forests that, that tended to occur along streams, <coughs> Uh, small bayous uh, and, and separated the prairie into units. And so lightning could have struck trees in those gallery forests, so those tended to be hardwoods. Uh, more likely it just struck the ground closer to the ground. We know, we know fire happens that way in other grassland systems across the world. This is an illustration from uh, Reed Noss's book, Grasslands of the South, just to give you a kind of perspective on how often ecosystems in the southeast were burning. And you can see that most of the coastal plain was burning 
every one to three years, whether or not it was a grassland, which a true grassland, which we have here and here, or along the pond, which is more or less everything else. I mean, almost the entirety of Florida was burning every one to three years. Uh, even even the bottom and hardwood zone, the Mississippi River alluvial valley. I mean, this says greater than 12 years. You know, a fire every 13 years would be amazing to me in some of those habitats. And it, it could have been that bottomland hardwood forests, uh, some of them, not swamps per se, but some of the higher level ones burned every 25, 30 years. We know switch cane is adapted to fire. We don't see these big switch cane thickets anymore. There's some thinking that maybe that's because there's no fire in that, in that zone anymore. But this is just to provide you kind of a picture of the fire climate of the southeast. If we overlay on top of that where lightning is happening, and this is just nine years of data from relatively recently, uh, you can see where lightning is tending to happen on the landscape. And this is to show uh, just uh, how much lightning we're getting and, and it really shows that we have more than enough lightning to account for the fire that we see in, in, the, in the historical record. So why did we stop burning and why did that leave the public conscious? Um, and that's an important question because fire uh, as, a, as a regular disturbance is not really a well understood concept among even kind of garden level ecologists. And that's for a reason. Starting in the early 1900s, the, a lot of the public land agencies decided fire is a, is a bad thing. And these were well-intentioned people. They were seeing, especially following a lot of the clear cutting that happened in, in the early 1900s, there were a lot of devastating fires. And they adopted this policy of fire suppression and some very successful marketing campaigns, including Smokey the Bear, which, which worked over a long time period. And it really wasn't until the 1980s and 1990s that we, we were able to get out of that. The science was strong enough to break away on a kind of a large whole, whole level way um, and, and start putting fire back on the ground again. But in the intervening years, I mean, I just talked about how often fire was happening across such a massive area. When, we, when you wholesale shut down fire for that long time, you're going to have some effects, and, we, and we, we've seen that. So to get to Coastal Prairie, um, I did have born of fire up here. There's some evidence that maybe uh, a lot of the grasslands in the south if you go back far enough, they actually started due to different climate conditions. It was, it was drier back then. Uh, and they, in the intervening many thousands of years, have developed uh, adaptations to fire. But regardless, um, many, many thousands of years of evolution between prairie and fire has occurred. And coastal prairie would not have evolved into what it is and, and really cannot be managed uh, in a pristine fashion today without fire. Now, uh, I think we've seen already today some beautiful examples of prairies that are managed without fire. And that's not to, and I think there's a place for those prairies, absolutely. And, uh, and for various reasons, fire is not an option for a lot of folks. And I think we need more research and understanding in that, in that world. But true prairie is a fire system. Already touched on this, but again, Lightning was the driver, uh, along with Native Americans, of fire. This is a photo from uh, Central Florida, Kissimmee Prairie, and not, not around here. But minus the road, that could be a, a scene from coastal Texas or southwest Louisiana um, at any point in the past. I just included this. This is from before when our talk was more geared to Longleaf. But it's just a way to. <laughs> Uh, explain to people who don't think about fire all the time and who don't think about it as a natural disturbance, a, nat a natural driver of ecosystem functioning. Uh, in, in these prairie systems, it really is uh, the main driver of, of biodiversity and uh, ecosystem function. 
Why do we care about coastal prairie? That's that's not necessarily a question for you guys who have come so long uh, from and from so far to this conference, but just generally, it, it's an incredibly biodiverse system. I, I, I don't need to tell you guys that, but um, the herbaceous communities in these grasslands are very rich. Uh, I think that the paper in your packet, in fact, uh, by Dr. Allen and, and my boss, Lattimore, from the mid-90s, looked at, I think, five different prairies in Louisiana, prairie remnants. Some of them were uh, restored, but in good condition. Some of them were true remnants. And they found nearly 600 species. About 30% of those were what we call weedy species, or either invasive or very disturbance-related. Uh, but they found well over 250 species of high conservation value, which is more than uh, the tall grass prairies in the Midwest. So this is a special system that deserves conservation. And I should say that uh, a lot of species do overlap with other ecosystems, not just the lonely pine flatwoods, but also the coastal marsh. And so, so there's not, the, the coastal prairie doesn't have a lot of a high level of endemism. There's not a, a lot of species that occur only in coastal prairie, but it's got a high level of biodiversity in terms of its uh, herbaceous community. The warm season grasses uh, are the backbone of the prairie. And again, this is probably not news to most of you, but uh, coastal prairie is not just a wildflower garden. Uh, and really, you can't have fire without the grasses. These grasses are what carry fire, and they are highly adapted to fire. And this is just some of them. There are so many. If you look at that packet, at that paper in your packet, and you go to the Poaceae, which is the grass family, just look at the number of species, and then go to the sedges and the rushes, and you kind of get an idea of the diversity that we're talking about. It's going to take me a lifetime to learn all these species. I mean, that's challenging, but that's cool, too. So what is fire actually doing? The, the main thing that it's doing is killing woody uh, shrubs, hardwoods, what we call brush. Uh, and in, in these prairie sites, you have kind of this constant influx of woody species. Fire is dealing with those at, at when, it's, when they're small enough and young enough to be killed. When they get large enough, they become resistant. And I'm sure some of you have seen that. But that's one of the main things the fire is doing in these systems. It's also stimulating, stimulating the flowering and seed production of a lot of, not just grasses, but a lot of the forbs. And it's preparing the open seed bed. Uh, a lot of times what, what will happen, or what would happen, is part of a prairie would burn, part of it wouldn't burn for one reason or another. You might have had a small, low wetland in between it. So suddenly you have big open bare ground with a lot of ash right seed bed and just right next door you have a repository for seed and so the fire is creating conditions for the improvement of diversity in that system as preventing any one or few species from dominating it's also recycling nutrients fire coastal prairie is a, a very uh, productive grassland relative to other grasslands that productivity can't be sustained without some sort of fire because a lot of the nutrients get locked up in we call the duck layer, dead grass, dead forbs. Uh, fire recycles those nutrients faster than would otherwise occur by, by uh, other methods. Uh, and then the last one is creating open conditions favored by many wildlife species. That's sort of an indirect effect of keeping the system open and favoring uh, conditions that a lot of those wildlife species are adapted to. So what happens when you remove fire from the coastal prairie system? I'm sure some of you have seen this, uh, both directly and indirectly. You relatively quickly get an influx of, of brush and trees. And this kind of goes back to my question of why was prairie here? And that's a question I had walking into this, uh, because I see a lot of these prairies where they're not getting treated with fire or mowing or herbicides, and you get these influx of trees and, and shrubs. And that makes me think, well, okay, 
if, if it was soil conditions, edaphic conditions, as, as we say, that were causing the prairie to, uh, or that, was, that was caused the prairie to be here, then we shouldn't see this influx of shrubs or trees, but we do. Uh, if it was just fire, then when, um, well, I'll leave that. Anyway, um, this is what happens when you take fire out of the system. And I mean, I don't know if you, get, you guys can tell that that's tallow. Tallow is clearly terrible. I'm sure you're all very familiar with it. But there's a lot of native species that, that uh, are problematic as well. So what are the factors that are driving the effects of fire on, on these landscapes? There's, there's three. There's how often is fire occurring? What time of year does fire occur? And what are the conditions that, that create that fire? such that it's intense or a relatively cool fire. And it's, the, it's the, the interconnectedness of those three conditions that lead to the heterogeneity that we see in prairies. That's why they're, they're such a diverse system. And I've talked a little bit about the frequency, but uh, we actually don't have a lot of research directly related to coastal prairie that tells us how often it burned. A lot of that knowledge we've gotten from the nearby Lonely Pine system from the tree ring record where there's, there's a, a record of the fires. And because a lot of the vegetative species overlap, uh, most scientists believe that the, the frequency of fire in Longleaf Flatwoods and Coastal Prairie was very similar. In Louisiana, it's just over two years, every 2.1 years, one to three years. Now that doesn't mean every 2.1 years a fire happened, or even this year and then uh, next year and then within three years. Sometimes you, you have a, an acre that burned every year and then you go five or six years without burning and then we burn two years after that. So there was natural variability built into the system, but over the long term, one to three years is about the average. The time of year is uh, much more complicated, hard to get at. And that's where the who done it question comes into play. And we, do, we know that uh, in the southeast, lightning tends to happen at a certain time of year. And this is from a study on the Kasachi National Forest looking at 20 years of, of natural lightning caused fires. And you can see when the majority of those fires were happening. It was in the heart of summer, June, July, August, some in May, some in September. So. The, the broad, the three word answer to when did fire happen in coastal prairie and longleaf pine is the growing season. But it's a little bit more complicated than that for a couple of reasons. Uh, number one, relative to a lot of the world, Louisiana's rainfall is relatively easy, uh, evenly distributed across the year. It's not like India where we have this massive rainfall and then a long dry period. Uh, but given that evenness, there are times of the year that are a little bit drier than other times of the year. And one of the times of the year that's a little bit drier is it's kind of late April through mid-June period. And that doesn't necessarily overlap with the highest amount of lightning. Because there is lightning in that period. And because of that, it, because it's a little bit drier there than it is here, and then it gets dry again here, but because it's a little bit drier here, we tended to get more fires in the early part of the growing season. The other aspect of that is pre-settlement, well before our time, the landscape was far less fragmented than it is now. We have all these roads and pipelines and neighborhoods and canals which fragment the landscape. If you take all that out and just think about even with the galleries, even with these carved up prairie units, you're still talking about really big units of prairie. Because of that, a single lightning strike tended to burn a lot of area. And because an area doesn't tend to burn again in a given growing season once it's burned once, there's kind of a waiting factor towards burning earlier on. So the early lightning strikes tended to, be, to burn the acreage, whereas the late lightning strikes didn't. Given all that, Lightning, I mean, there was still plenty of wildfire that was happening in July, August, September. Most of it, we think, was happening in this May, June, early July. So 
Why does that matter? We found, others have found, this is more or less an objectively known truth now. Um, shrubs and woody species tend to be best controlled by these early growing season fires, mid-April to into May. And that matters when you're trying to do restoration and get rid of these shrubs. Uh, you, there, is a, there is a vast difference between what happens when you burn shrubs in that time period versus January, February, or December, which is historically when a lot of these areas were burned uh, by early settlers and they were trying to burn for different reasons. They were trying to stimulate grasses for cattle for forage. Uh, this is more of a basic kind of background thing. A lot of you may know this. Just because uh, species are native doesn't mean that they ought to occur in an ecosystem, especially at a certain level of density, a uh, certain level of, um, yeah, certain level. So there's plenty of species that are native to the southeast and native to the coastal prairie region, which did not historically occur in the coastal prairie, at least not in any large scale. And a lot of those we deal with in coastal prairie. If you if you haven't experienced these yet, you probably will if you start managing coastal prairie. And maybe, y'all. I know y'all in Texas have some different ones than we do, uh, but these are some of the bad ones that we deal with. I don't have tallow on here, that's, that's for a reason, that's not by accident, I'm talking about that. Anymore. Tallow, of course, is, is one of the worst. It doesn't play by the rules, so to speak. Frequent fire promotes high diversity uh, and, and Declines in fire generally lead to declines in diversity. That's just kind of a general principle. Part of the reason for that is because plants, not just grasses, but a lot of the forbs, flower only weekly or they don't flower at all without fire. And this is especially true of some of our uh, cornerstone grasses, the, the Schizocurium, Andropogon, those, those groups which form the backbone of the prairie. And this is from Lattimore's property. This is in St. Tammany Parish, uh, Longleaf Pine Flatwoods, but operates similarly to Coastal Prairie. He burned this in February and this the following May. And this, this photo, I think, was taken in October or November. And you can see the density. There's still grass flowering here, but you can see the density, that, the density difference between these two. This is just one piece of land on you know, one example, but it's just it's an example of that concept. This is another example. Uh, this is from a study by Dr. William Platt, studies long leaf fire systems, uh, Pityopsis graminiflora, narrow leaf silk grass. Uh, they found that both the the flower floral induction, the flowering to begin with, and the fecundity, how many flowers you get, were both greater following May and August fires relative to January fires. And then following the fires, there was greater seedling abundance in the May burn plots than in, than in August burn plots and then the lowest in the January plots. If you've never seen a place after fire, it can be a little disconcerting. Uh, it, it can look like a bomb kind of went off. And, and, and I think, you know, that's, that's a natural reason why we're a little bit naturally averse to fires looks bad. Uh, this is at Lake Ramsey Savannah WMA, which is a, uh, and I'm sorry for all the long leaf examples. <laughs> um, that's, that's, that, that's the uh, basis for this talk. But this, again, this applies definitely in coastal prairie. That could look like a coastal prairie site for sure. Um, and this is in St. Tammany Parish. This is two months later on the same site. And this is Tenium uh, aromaticum, which if, if it occurs in coastal prairie, I think it's probably rarer in coastal prairie than it is in Longleaf Flatwoods, but does occur in coastal prairie. And it is uh, what, what Larry was calling one of those tens. It's one of those very, those, those species that biologists get, botanists get excited about. Uh, and, but it's, it's highly fire dependent. This is uh, a term that Lattimore likes to use, old growth ground cover. And you know, we think about old growth in terms of, uh, in relation to forests, because forests take so long to develop. Um, but that's, that's kind of what he's getting at. A lot of these very diverse herbaceous communities 
take a long time to develop. And they're not going to necessarily happen overnight. And that's something that you have to realize when you're using fire. Is it, it helps to think of fire as a process rather than as a single time tool. Uh, especially on, on you know, early phase restoration sites, you're not going to burn one time and then have this beautiful, incredible diversity immediately. It, it takes a long time for the systems to develop. And that's partially why protecting these, these coastal prairie remnants is so important. This is a species that is um, not known from coastal prairie, it's known from St. Tammy, but I included it in here because it's an example of, it's outside the pattern. So I said most fires tend to happen in the growing season. Nature has patterns, but those patterns are loose. And so fires happen all the time outside of the growing season, it just depending on the conditions for that, for that year. Some species are adapted to those exceptions rather than to the rule. And this is an example of that. This species tends to flower, uh, it, it, it uh, flowers after January, kind of, or February burns. And I don't know, maybe somebody in here who's a better botanist than me, there, I'm sure there are species in the coastal prairie which are similar, uh, but I, I don't know. Yellow pitcher plant, which also tends to uh, occur more often in flatwood savanna, but also occurs in coastal prairie, is stimulated by fire as well uh, into flower. There are many, many uh, hundreds more uh, fire-dependent species in Louisiana, and again, it, it's a it's a lifelong process to learn, um, but that's that's part of the beauty of what we do. This is this is a species that's. Um, Rare in southwest Louisiana, but only tends to, tends to occur in southwest Louisiana, and it's highly adapted to fire. It's, it's in the Menara group, uh, Lindheimer's bee blossom. So some pointers uh, for any of you that might have the opportunity to use fire. If you're, if you're burning and you are early in the restoration phase, and you're not dealing with a relatively high quality site, you may have to use fire more frequently early on in the game, every year perhaps. And part of that is to deal with the, the, the woody shrub uh, density that you may have. A lot of times there's a, there's a seed bank there and there's gonna be resprouting that goes on. Another reason is because the fires early on in the process may not be as hot as you would like. And if that's because you don't necessarily have the, the grass uh, cover that you want to carry fire to make it as hot as you like. So don't be afraid to use fire uh, early and often in the process. An another benefit uh, that you have in prairie that you don't have in forested systems is you don't have to worry about killing trees. You know, natural fire occasionally kill trees, even, even species like longleaf and shortleaf, which are highly adapted to fire, occasionally trees die. But when we, you know, because trees take so long to grow, we are trying not to kill them. And so there may be days where uh, we might look at a longleaf site and say, mm, it's, it's a little bit too low the humidity, the wind's too high, it's too hot, we're not gonna burn today. That wouldn't be an issue necessarily in coastal prairie. So it, it gives you some flexibility, which, especially if you're managing a lot of land, which I, I realize a lot of smaller level landowners, that's not an issue, and that's great. But if you're managing a land, you gotta burn a lot of land, you need all the burn days you can get. And you, you're constrained by weather to begin with. And then, as I mentioned, tend to burn in spring. That's, that's the best time to burn. Don't be afraid to burn outside of spring at all. Winter burns are okay. It's better to burn any time of the year than it is to not burn, especially for long periods of time. So just to talk about some of the wildlife species, um, there's a whole bunch of, of sparrows. If you can tell just how fun and sparrow ID is here. Mm -hmm. um, the winter grassland birds uh, in Louisiana and, and Southeast Texas Many of them are highly adapted to fire-maintained systems. This is Hinslow's sparrow. Uh, 
uh, which uh, has been declining for many years, as has this is Botkin's sparrow. Both of them are, uh, they will occur in longleaf, but also occur in prairie. And they, they, they need uh, systems which are maintained as grassland, preferably via fire. Of course, at large prairie chicken has been talked about multiple times today. Uh, this species did occur in Louisiana at one time, and we would love to get it back um, one day, but that's, I think, a long-term vision. And then there's lots of other species which may not be as tightly tied to coastal prairie itself, maybe a little bit more flexible in the, in the types of grasslands they can use, uh, but still benefit from coastal prairie, especially healthy, burnt, well-burned coastal prairie. Whooping crane has been recently reintroduced in Louisiana um, and historically did use coastal prairie, uh, crawfish frog, Lacan sparrow, eastern meadowlark. I included this. We get a lot of blowback from, from a lot of our, our hunters um, on our lands. We, almost all of our lands, we lease out for hunting. And, a lot of them tell us, don't, don't burn in the spring, don't burn in the spring, you're going to burn up my turkey nest. And they're right. <laughs> we're burning up the turkey nest a lot of times when we're burning in the spring. Uh, but lots of studies have shown that, um, well, number one, turkeys will readily re-nest. And number two, the habitat uh, improvement that you're doing for the turkeys by burning uh, far outweighs the, the mortality that's associated with the burning. So sometimes that's a bit of a hard sell. Given all that, in southwest Louisiana, turkeys are basically gone as of the time being. There's really no turkeys in southwest Louisiana. I don't know about coastal Texas. Anybody go in? Do y'all have turkeys? Pretty snow. Yeah. I think they were uh, historically a lot more common than they are now. A lot of that is because of the conversion. I mean, so much of south Louisiana is not in any type of natural state anymore. It's rice, crawfish, sugarcane, etc. Um, this is just a primer on inv invasive versus non-native species. Um, I know in Texas y'all have some different ones than we do, but you also probably share some of these. Among the worst uh, across the state are tallow and uh, Chinese cricket, just, just really mean, um, bad guys. And both of them will occur in coastal prairie. Of course, the Chinese towel is far more apt to. And this is, this is Chinese cricket, of course, tallow. Tallow will, um, a lot of it depends on the size of the tree. So the larger the, the tree, the more uh, resistant it is to fire. But especially in the growing season, you can do a lot of damage to tallow. Uh, and it especially, a lot of times you'll burn, you'll burn it and it'll die back and then it'll re-sprout and it'll re-sprout at like 10 or 20 different stems, which is a little bit um, disconcerting, um, frustrating. But multiple fires over, even if you're spacing them two or three years apart, um, you can do some serious damage to tallow. Now, at a certain level, you're not going to be able to carry fire across uh, a site because tallow leaves are naturally resistant to fire. And so at a certain level, you're going to have to use herbicide to, to deal with tallow. This one is coven grass. How many of you have heard of this species before? Yeah, OK. Um, this is real bad dude. In, Eastern Louisiana and in Mississippi and Alabama. Yeah, it is known from west of the Mississippi River. Uh, but for whatever reason, it has not proliferated yet. I would advise you to learn this grass. Uh, it, we may still be at a point where we can keep it out. And it loves fire. You're not going to do, it's not like tallow. You're not going to do anything to coat grass with fire except probably improve conditions for it. And so there's a potential for another invasive species with coven grass to really change the game. It's become a, so much of a problem in the Florida parishes and east of there that uh, a lot of money gets spent dealing with that. And it, 
it would it would just be one more problem to deal with in the restoration of the prairies. So it, it may be inevitable. Some would say so, but uh, I would like to think not. So. Yeah, this is just talking about how how it likes fire. Ultimately, with coat and grass, you're going to have to use herbicides, but herbicides in concert with fire can be effective. Um, this is just a primer before I finish about uh, the case for growth season burning. Uh, I've already touched on a lot of this, but the, the, the tree ring record at Kasachi shows that approximately two thirds of the burn uh, going back to pre settlement times were in the growing season. And like I mentioned, the average return frequency was just over two years. And I've touched on all that as well. Um, I guess the take home message is to consider spring burning as the kind of the, the foundation. And you can go outside of that, but that ought to be your foundation. I don't know, I'd like to hear from any of you who, who may have burned or, um, Backris. I know we have backers on some of the more coastal sites here. I've never burned backers, and I know that that can be a, a headache in some sites um, further south, and maybe over in Texas. So, if any of you have any insight? I'd love to know. It comes back. It comes back. That's what I thought. <laughs> that I would um, backers, uh, and all that stuff. Just come back. Yeah. <clears throat> This is a, this is a site at one of the uh, one of the restored prairies in Louisiana, following a, a uh, I think this is in the fall, following a, a growing season burn. So, the actress had a beautiful site. Um, this is kind of the last take home point. Um, the conditions on the day and time and and, um, and the time that you burn are almost just as important as the season of the burn. So if you're burning in in April, but it's you know a very cool day with high humidity. You're not you know you're not going to get the same level of burn. And the opposite is true if you're burning in August and um, you, you, the conditions aren't right for a hot burn. You know it's going to cancel out to some degree the effects of the season. So just recall, remember that that's something that anybody who's doing regular burning needs to be aware of. Weather is everything. Uh, this is just TNC's fire program. Um, we have, we call the CGC crew, they're, a, they're a, our internal fire crew. They operate east of the Mississippi River. Uh, they burn, I think we burn five to 6,000 acres this year on multiple preserves in uh, southeast Louisiana and south Mississippi. Uh, I'm responsible for preserves west of the river and I, I have to rely on contractors and I kind of talked about the, the what and the background of burning today, but the logistics and the how that you end up burning is even more important, and that's a whole other discussion. Um, I'd love to talk with anybody about that later. But uh, So there's a whole different dynamic to having your own internal crew with using contractors. So I have to talk for another day. That's it. Thank you very much. Prescribed fire councils or burn associations. And I know that the Louisiana Prescribed Fire Council is meeting in Alexandria next Wednesday. I guess their 10th annual meeting. It seems like that the, the, the Louisiana Fire Council is more geared on those pine systems, along these systems. Can you, can you think of any sort of uh, prescribed fire association or council or group that's really centered on the like, coastal prairies? Maybe maybe not just in Louisiana, but also. No, no, I, I wish I did. And that's part of that, I think that that, that problem is a, a demand versus supply problem. We have so little area in Louisiana. You know, you in Texas, I know that you think about, oh, uh, we're, we're losing our prairie. Well, we, we already lost our prairie. We have essentially zero left. And so for us, it's a matter of restoration now. And, and 
protecting the little bitty fragments that we have left. And so there's just not enough burning going on. Now that being said, there's a whole bunch of sugar cane burning going on, which is a whole different animal. And so there may be some, some ag burning groups that are, that are looking at those issues, but they're not necessarily going to be tuned into the, to the ecology side of the question. But they are going to be dealing with law and community relations and that sort of thing. But off the top of my head, I, I don't have anything. Are your contract burners, are they, do they have to be NWCG certified? Or? Um, we, we know. We don't make our contractors. Um, now, they have to have extensive insurance, and our internal crew has to be certified on that level. Uh, but if we were to, to go to that route, we wouldn't. We wouldn't get any contractors. There's just not, and that's, this is a serious problem. I'm sure it's the same way in Texas, but um, there's just a lack of, of prescribed burners out there. And so a lot of times we're forced into kind of, sometimes we're forced into not being able to burn just because we don't have enough uh, capacity. Um, but we really don't have a lot of choices, and that's, that's an issue that we're trying to work on going forward. But um, yeah, right now we, we can't set too tight of restrictions on them. Although I know that our larger umbrella organization would like to. It's on safety. Texas has a flight and board. actually get around. Is that right? Yeah. And then they have, so you have to go through an extensive training process and then actually be approved by the state board and you carry mm -hmm. license and then you have to carry insurance and then you can be a commercial prescribed well, buyer. Well, Louisiana has a prescribed burner certification system. Uh, but it's not required to burn, and all all it's really doing is protecting you in terms of the, the legal ramifications. Yeah. Private landowners don't have to go through that. Okay. Yeah, but to be that to be a, a commercial. Yeah. Do you have any uh, experience with the effectiveness on prescribed burns on the uh, kudzu as an invasive species? I don't. I've never had to burn kudzu. Um, I would imagine that it does not burn very well unless it's already been killed. Um, but I don't know. Anybody? Kudzu is not... You have to get it dry enough to catch fire. Yeah, <laughs> right. that's, that's what I'm thinking. It's, it's such a robust fire. plant with so much green on it that I wouldn't imagine it lights up very well. Um, and kudzu is, for all its, its bad reputation, is not really that bad, at least in Louisiana. We have way worse invasives. Yeah, goats will, goats will eat anything. Yes, yeah, sure, yeah. <laughs> yeah. uh, and, and, and there's somebody coming up to talk about grazing in, in prairie systems, I know, later on. So um, he may or may not touch on goats, I'm not sure. But uh, <coughs> TNC, we are looking at grazing uh, options in, in, in Longleaf and in uh, future prairie sites. But uh, there's a whole other set of issues that come with that. So, so for the long-term management of either restored or prey remnants, it seemed like from your presentation you seemed to suggest that the, the timing of fire should be altered over the, like a 10-year period. Maybe every now and then you got to throw one in in the off-season to encourage some diversity of species. So it's not necessarily that you're always going to be burning the same part of the growing season. You want to kind of mix it up. Exactly, exactly. And the way we think about it is we kind of have a restoration phase and then we have what we call a maintenance phase. And a lot of times during the restoration phase, and, and where you set that line is relatively arbitrary. You're basing it on some sort of science. But um, a lot of time in the restoration phase, we're burning more often. We're, we're making, we almost never would deviate from a spring or growing season burn. But once you're into the maintenance phase, you can get out of that a little bit. You can be more flexible. You can play around. Um, and as long as you're always burning within the limits of safety and reason. Um, but there's nothing wrong with going outside of the growing season location. So in Central Texas, like, it depends on the land and the fields and the So if they want a nice field of flowers, well, we're going to burn it in the uh, heat of the summer, right? So that it's disturbed and open for the cool season time. 
their goals and objectives, and then we'll grass this year, then we'll burn it earlier in the year so that the grass doesn't have time to work. Yeah. And we are only constrained by our objectives. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so uh, and our objectives generally are the, the natural diversity of the system. And so that is an important consideration, especially when you're working with, uh, when you're at the, the beck and call of somebody else's. So uh, I get that. And I, you know, that, that's, you're well to take that into consideration. All right, good, good, good discussion. I'm going to pause it there. If anybody has any more questions for Will, I catch them right now at the break. We're going to take about a 10-minute break. And this